Okay, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, today, we're going to do our next uh, Consumable Hemp Louisiana Department of Health webinar. Uh, this one is going to be in regards to labeling of products, and this one is uh, a little more hyper-focused than the uh, first webinar where we were very broad. We went over lots of different topics. This one, we're just going to focus on labeling. Uh, if you have any questions, the chat should be available to you. Please put your question in the chat. We will try to answer. It may be answered as the during the course of the presentation, uh, but we will have a spot at the end to where we will try to get to as many as we can, depending on how many questions there are. If for some reason we do not answer your question, um, you know, send us an email or we will still, you know, we have a copy of this chat. We will try to reach out to you and, and send that. Um, please try to be respectful of one another. Please don't put anything uh, inappropriate or anything like that. Um, we are recording this. Uh, once the presentation is completed, uh, we make sure that there are, you know, we get rid of this pausing time in the beginning and we paste it onto our website so that it can be viewed later. Uh, as always, please try to pay attention to our website for updates, uh, ldh.la.gov slash hemp. Uh, any webinars, any information, uh, frequently asked questions, forms, changes to rules, things like that, that all gets put up there. And of course, you can always reach out to us. And we're going to show our, web, our email addresses as well so you can reach out. Uh, I already see a question. Um, Somebody's asking if they can record. We were for the public. I really don't mind, but we do. We are putting this presentation and this recording up on our website. It'll actually be up on YouTube. So you can review it as many times as you want there. Um, my uh, uh, co-worker and co-host is Brian Warren. He will introduce himself in a moment. Uh, he has access to the controls as well. So what I'm going to begin doing is I'm going to share the other screen, so just bear with me, and it's going to bring up our presentation. You should still be able to hear us. If for some reason you get kicked out, uh, you know, just because the Internet or something like that, just try to jump back in. I don't have a restriction on it, so you kind of come and go. All right, so I'm going to begin sharing my other screen. Let's see if this works. Okay. Can y'all see it? Brian, can you see it? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I tried to make it a little, we, we learn each time we do these webinars, so I tried to make it full screen this time. Uh, so again, my name is Justin Grimion. Um, this is the Louisiana Department of Health Consumable Hemp Product Registration or Label Registration webinar. Uh, we're going to be kind of getting uh, you know, a little more detailed into it this time. Uh, here's my contact information. Email is always the best way to reach us. We're not, we are field operators, we're inspectors, we're sometimes out in the world uh, visiting your facilities, traveling around the state. Uh, phone, you can leave a message, we might be able to get back to you depending on when we actually sit back at our desk. Email is always the best way. So, let's get right into it. Um, we're going to go over, I'm going to give you a brief overview first, and then Mr. Warren is going to go a little more in depth of each one. So what we're going to go over is all the different parts of a general food and drug product label. We try to follow FDA protocols as much as possible. And the reason we do this is because we want not only our products that are produced here in Louisiana to leave the state and enter the rest of the country, and hopefully the rest of the world, we want them to be able to be legal wherever they go. And if we follow FDA protocols, that's usually the best course of action. And we want the same, any products that are coming into the state, we wanna make sure they're matching and meeting all these, uh, these guidelines for safety. So we try to do the best we can on, on upholding that. We are also gonna go into the very uh, detailed uh, uh, labeling just for consumable hemp. And they're, they're almost exactly the same, but there are some, some unique items that we're going to discuss. So for the most part, these parts of the label is the statement of identity. 
So that's, and Bron well, again, Mr. Warren's going to go into in depth of each one, but that statement of identity is basically saying, what is it? Is it gummies? Is it cookies? Is it a tincture? We actually want you to say those words. We just don't want to have a package and we don't want the consumer, and remember, we do this for the consumer to educate themselves. We don't want the consumer to guess what's in the bottle. We want you to tell them right out what is in there. And we don't want you to be, we don't want firms to be, uh, you know, cute or clever. We want you to be honest. Tell us what it is. Um, as, as few words as possible is always better. Um, the net quantity contents declaration. You know, we're going to say some fancy words too. If for some reason you don't understand the words that we use or the terms we use, ask us in the chat. We'll be happy to, to, to explain what they are. But that net quantity of contents, that is basically uh, how much of that product is there. How much, of, what is the weight? How many ounces is it? Is it how many in liquid fluid ounces? You know, we want it in, you know, U.S. standard or imperial and metric. We want them in both. Um, this is always a... Uh, a part of contention, that net quantity, because that is something that not everybody is unique and they have to make sure that that product is there. I'll go one step further with net quantity. Not only is that important for us and for the consumer to understand how much of the product they're buying, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also important because the Louisiana Department of Agriculture will come around and weigh these products to make sure they're honest in what you're selling them. Uh, ingredient statement declaration. This one's pretty self-explanatory. We want you to tell us exactly what's inside that product. And that is so the consumer can make, again, educated decisions on what they, on what they purchase. We don't need to know how much. Like in other words, we don't want to know your recipe. We don't want you to put that on the container. Uh, we just want you to put what's in it. And again, you know, as, as explanatory as you can, uh, responsible party declaration. Who's making it? Uh, is, did someone make it for you? Did someone ship it into the state for you? Is someone co-packing it? Is it, um, is it distributed by you, but it's not really made by you? You know, there's lots of different ways to say this. Uh, again, this is so the consumer can, can see what they're purchasing. And the last one is, and this is an important one, that allergy declaration. Everybody should be familiar with this one. Um, there's always allergy, uh, you know, warnings and stuff on packaging. But what we really mean is we want to make sure that you're actually putting the name of the allergens in the ingredient list. Again, if someone is allergic to milk, you know, we want to make sure that and you use milk in your product. We want to make sure that is there in some form in that ingredient list so that the consumer can avoid it if they have an allergen. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And I think this one's Mr. Warren's. So, yep. So this one's Mr. Warren. So, uh, Mr. Warren, please introduce yourself and you can take it from there and just tell me I'll move the slide when you're ready. If you can't move it. Uh, sounds fine, sir. So, uh, my name is Brian Warren. Again, I am the program administrator for the food and drug unit and the milk and dairy unit for the Louisiana department of health and hemp products currently fall under our remit. So, this is one of my programs, and of course, Mr. Grimion is my supervisor. Now, uh, to pick up the thread where he uh, left it for me. So for a statement of identity, this is obviously one of your mandatory declarations, and it's what, we've, what we're saying here. We want a, a clear and unambiguous statement of what the product is. Um, that seems like something on the surface that would be fairly straightforward. Often it, it isn't. And I've listed some of the pitfalls that you can, uh, you can run into with this particular um, declaration. If you're just sort of, and I see this on a lot of products, people sort of throw the kitchen sink at, at a label in terms of what to call something. <clears throat> you you want to try to... Um, you want to you want to try to sort of exercise a certain amount of restraint, stick to something that's simple, direct, and uh, explains to the user what this item is. Uh, you don't want to either as an ingredient declaration or as a statement of identity for your product simply use the name of a um, a 
cannabinoid that you're interested in marketing. So you don't want to call it CBD or uh, Delta 8 THC or CBN. You know, you want to stipulate, you know, maybe that's an isolate, maybe that's an extract, maybe it's an oil, but whatever it is, you, you want to be very clear about that. And the last item, of course, and this is part of the statutory language that we've had on these products since the inception of this program, uh, these items are not to be referred to using the term dietary or as dietary supplements. Okay. So the net quantity of contents. Again, uh, this is uh, essentially stating how much of your product is within that particular container. You can express this in terms of uh, fluid or volumetric measurement or in weight measure or in certain cases as a numerical count. And we're going to go into detail on all of those. Next slide. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so starting with your fluid or volumetric measurement. So typically with the products that we're seeing that are packaged for consumer use, that's going to be on the scale of something in fluid ounces and milliliters. Sometimes you may, you know, if you're selling something in a fairly large size, uh, maybe something that you're intending to resell for repackers perhaps, um, you may be, you know, dealing with things in terms of quarts or gallons and liters, but generally speaking, you're going to be talking about fluid ounces and milliliters. Um, okay, no, I don't want to talk about that yet. Okay, uh, the prefatory statement. Now, what we're talking about here uh, is something that sort of precedes it and indicates what this statement is. So it's something in the case of a fluid measurement like net or net contents. The one thing that I do see a lot that you don't want to do on this is actually um, use something that references weight when you, your statement is actually expressed in terms of fluid or volumetric measurement. Now we have some examples here at the bottom of the slide of items that are done correctly. Okay. All right, so weight measure. Again, for the consumer sizes that are going to be distributed here, typically we're talking about things expressed in uh, ounces and grams. Now, unlike the fluid measure statements, a prefatory statement on these is required. And usually that's going to be net weight or some abbreviated form of those two words. Okay, um, and again, we have some examples here at the bottom of the slide of items that are formatted correctly. Okay, so the third is a numerical count, and there's uh, sort of several elements to this. First is the time when it's acceptable to use a numerical count is when you have discrete items, okay? So um, if, it's, if the product you're producing is a fluid or it's a powder, you know, uh, those are going to be forms that would not be conducive to having a numerical count. So here we're talking about things like tablets or gummies, you know, that, that you can easily just pick one up and hold it in your hand and, you know, it's a discrete thing, okay? So again, uh, a prefatory statement here really isn't required. You're just basically saying, I have these, you know, this number of items that are within this container. So we have some examples here. Now, one thing that um, I wanted to note in terms of when you use a numerical count, okay. So the point that we're trying to make when we're going over these different forms of a net quantity statement is that 
you're, you're generally, you're going to use one of these and stick with it, and it's going to be whichever one is appropriate to that particular product. But, um, and this comes down to some Louisiana-specific requirements in terms of when we're talking about items that actually contain some measure of tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, those items, we're going to need to assess whether that formulation is legal for distribution in Louisiana. So in the situation where you have products that contain THC, we may need some additional information uh, on those items to be able to make those calculations. The rule in Louisiana is that there's a, a threshold cutoff for total THC, which in again in Louisiana means any form of THC plus tetrahydrocannabinolic acid of 1%. Okay, and so this is a few of the common mistakes that we see. So as I already mentioned, um, you don't want to mix and match with your imperial and your metric statements, okay? They should both be fluid measure or both be weight measure, but not a combination of the two, okay? And that's going to be, again, based on the nature of the product that you're producing. Uh, and I did also mention, you know, using a net weight statement with a declaration that's expressed in terms of fluid measure. Also a situation that, you know, you want to avoid. And of course, again, it is mandatory to have that prefatory statement when you're using weight measure. So you should never omit that on a product where you're expressing that net quantity in terms of weight measure. All right, so uh, ingredient statements. This is your next mandatory declaration. So the language that's used in regulation is the items in your product should be listed in descending order of predominance in the finished product. And of course, what that means, simply put, is you're taking the, I, the constituent that's the greatest component of that and then you're going from there to the one that's the smallest component, okay? We're looking for something that starts with the word ingredients, literally, okay? Colon, and then you list those things out separated by commas, okay? So any, uh, anything that has sub-ingredients will need an ingredient statement. And anything that is a compound ingredient will also require a sub-ingredient declaration. Now, what is a compound ingredient? So we have simple and compound ingredients, right? A simple ingredient is simply one thing, water, coffee, okay? Uh, a compound ingredient is something that may be composed of lots of other ingredients. So I have some examples here butter, uh, margarine, enriched wheat flour, um, seasoning blends. There, there are any, any number of things that may be considered compound ingredients. All of those require a parenthetical declaration of those sub-ingredients in your listing. Okay? And then the last thing that I wanted to point out at, in terms of ingredients relates to prohibited ingredients. So the change that was made this year is that it is now permissible for topical products to contain uh, what, are, what are called OTCs. They're essentially drug components other than phytocannabinoids, okay? Um, again, only for topicals, okay? So <laughs> anything that's intended for ingestion this is still not allowed. Okay. Brian, can you go back to that slide one more time again? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what I'm going over. 
You, you wanted you to go back over the slide you just went, you just mentioned. Okay. You wanted you to go back. All over. of it? Okay. Well. So, hey, everybody, and, and um, I'll make a statement again. If, if you have a question, please type it in the chat. Okay. So, an ingredient statement. We're talking about ingredients, colon, and a list of those ingredients. So, and you know, order of predominance in the finished product. So the thing that's the greatest component down to the thing that's the least component, separate those out by commas. If you have compound ingredients, and many things are compound ingredients, those items will require a parenthetical sub-ingredient declaration. So you're gonna have the name of that ingredient, and then you're gonna follow that by an open parentheses mark. You're gonna have that list again in uh, order of predominance from greatest to least. You have that list separated out by commas, then you're gonna close that parentheses mark, and then you'll continue listing your ingredients from there. Okay, I have some examples here of compound ingredients. Obviously there are many, many more. Um, and then we went over the change in the statutory language where uh, drug components can now be other than phytocannabinoids can now be included in topical products that fall under this regulation, but not items that are intended for uh, internal use. Okay. Here are some common problems that we see with the ingredient statements. Again, um, if you're not good at spelling you, and uh, you're, you're not, you know, the best person for that, have someone else at your firm proofread this before you send it to us, okay? Uh, we generally don't harp on um, mechanical errors. Now, I'm happy to point these things out to folks for them to correct if they so desire. But we generally don't harp on those kinds of errors outside of your mandatory statements. But, you know, the mandatory statement, if you have something that's named wrong or it's spelled incorrectly, you know, the purpose of these things is to provide very clear communication to your intended market. And if things, you know, are misspelled or listed incorrectly, then you're not achieving that goal. So make sure that things are spelled and punctuated appropriately. If you have a doubt about whether something's a compound ingredient, talk to your supplier, okay? Because uh, there, that's something that we also run into a lot is compound ingredients shown on an ingredient statement declaration without a sub-ingredient declaration. So, you know, when you're putting this information on here, Start by going to that original packaging and making sure that you've copied the ingredients correctly from there. Okay, that's going to help you a lot in terms of ensuring that your ingredients are listed correctly on your own products. Another uh, pretty common issue that we see in, in this area is um, an inappropriate use of categorical names. So, a categorical name is essentially where I'm saying, you know, here's this whole group of things. I'm not telling you which specific item is actually in my product. I'm just going to call it a sweetener or a cannabinoid. Okay. So here again, it is required that you tell your customers what's in your product. And, you know, it's not supposed to be structured in such a way that they have to guess or call somebody else to figure it out. It should be very clear in the language you're using in your ingredient statement. Um, so FDA has actually um, uh, sent warning letters to bakeries over things like this last one. Um, so try to avoid the use of uh, fanciful language and if you have more than 
you know, three or four words that are characterizing an ingredient, you've probably gone off the rails somewhere, is what I can tell you. Um, I, I, I do want to step in and just clarify, just in case everybody's not sure. The fanciful language is love, just to make sure we're all understanding. You want to put that on your package somewhere, made with love? I, I really don't. It doesn't bother us too much. We'd prefer you to leave it off, but that's fine. It does not belong in your ingredient list. So I think that that's, that is a key point that we're trying to get across there is we tend to be, as long as you're not making any kind of an unapproved claim, we tend to be a lot more lenient with the marketing language. But when you're, you know, actually stipulating things in a mandatory declaration, you should be hewing pretty closely to a sort of a dragnet, just the facts ma'am approach. Okay. Brian, I want to focus a little more on this one because I do think, you know, this is something... And I, I want to explain to everyone, you know, everything on that label is important. Everything we're talking about is important. The area that we're going to focus on more than anything, and I would say for health reasons, the most important is this ingredient list. Again, it tells the consumers exactly what's in the product in case they need to consume something or avoid something one way or the other. And being truthful and honest is paramount. So we want you to be as explicit as possible. We don't want you to be vague. We want you to be clear. So Brian, I, I want to ask you, and I'm not, I don't think I heard you say it, but I do want to throw one out there so that everybody can hear it as well. Um, let's talk briefly uh, about vanilla extract, your favorite. Uh, we see it a lot, especially these new consumable hemp products. A lot of people are baking uh, or adding them to sweets. Well, uh, and that is a very, uh, even in our normal food products, that can be one that can be tricky. So explain vanilla for a moment. So what we're seeing is that, you know, we have people with varying degrees of experience in the hemp industry. And now that we are allowing um, food products to be registered, you know, with these phytocannabinoids or these hemp derived compounds being added to those um, as Mr. Grimion was indicating, um, this can be a bit of a challenge even for folks who have many years of experience in the food industry, but we have a lot of folks coming into this who don't have much experience or any experience in the food realm, and it can be particularly challenging for those folks to understand some of these requirements. So to touch on um, one of my triggers, which is the word vanilla. Um, so typically um, we see this word a lot on labels. And um, so one of my favorite lines from The Princess Bride is, I do not think this word means what you think it means. And generally speaking, this is the case when you're dealing with the word vanilla. So if I see the word vanilla, I should assume that that means that someone is adding vanilla pods or vanilla beans to a product, but that's not really what's happening, okay? Most of the time, this is a natural or artificial flavor or a natural and artificial flavor, okay? So if that's what's being used, then that should be declared as a natural uh, and or artificial vanilla flavor, depending on which one, again, is in use. Um, sometimes what you have is a vanilla extract, and this is actually uh, a food additive that has a standard of identity in the Code of Federal Regulations. So it's typically what we're talking about are vanilla bean extractives in water and at least 35% uh, ethanol. And then there are optional added ingredients. So then, you know, it behooves you as someone who's 
uh, manufacturing a product if you are someone who is manufacturing a product. To again, play, pay close attention to those ingredient statements on the ingredients that you are using and ensuring that you are doing your due diligence in terms of transferring that information where it is needed onto your artwork. So I'm gonna jump back in one second again, because again, this is an important slide. Be clear what you put in your ingredient list. If it's, you know, if it's vanilla, if it's vanilla extract, put vanilla extract, and if there's sub-ingredients, put your sub-ingredients. If it's vanilla beans, or you know, a pod, you know, put vanilla pod or vanilla bean, even that's okay, you know. Um, one of the, the examples we say that are not allowed, and by all means, if someone on the line has submitted a product and we have mentioned something to you about it and we're using you as an example right now, uh, we're not picking on you. Believe me, these are common mistakes. Uh, again, not just with the consumable hemp industry, with food industry in general. So uh, please do not take any of this personally. Um, we have the one up there, fruit puree. We want to know what the fruit is. Uh, sometimes it's lemons and somebody's adding whole fresh lemons, put lemons, put, that's what you're adding. Oh, but I puree them up first. I, I don't care how you prep it. You're still adding lemons. So just say lemons. But if you open a can of processed lemons and they're canned lemons and on the back of that can, they may be preservatives, sub ingredients, things like that, then that's where we want to see, you know, canned lemons or exactly what they are, are, are gelled lemons or, you know, pureed lemons, can and then all those sub-ingredients. So please try to be very explicit when you do your, your ingredient list. Uh, so we're going to keep moving on because we do have a few more slides. Okay. Um, actually, if it's okay, there are two other points I'd like to address. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, broadly speaking, I feel like this is something that's probably worth mentioning. So when you have something that is actually marketed as a flavorant, okay, as a flavor ingredient for a food product, um, that is something where the rules actually allow you not to have a sub-ingredient declaration on that. But just remember, it should say the word flavor on that product label when you're purchasing that item to use in your product. If it says flavor, okay, that's one thing where you do not have to list the sub-ingredients on your label. However, if it is an extract, you do. Now, the other thing that I wanted to go over when I'm just kind of looking at this uh, slide as Mr. Grimion was speaking, uh, we commonly see an issue with terpenes in these products. So, um, the first thing that I want to say about that is, and this is, you know, again, just broadly speaking, true of any ingredients. Um, there is, well, again, I have to, I have to be careful because we're talking about things that can be classified in a number of different ways. So, uh, fragrance ingredients in cosmetic products are not required to be declared by name. And there are exceptions that you can apply to FDA for, for something that would be a, an ingredient that you do not disclose for a cosmetic product. Okay. Broadly speaking, however, it is accurate to say that there's no such thing as a secret ingredient. So the items that comprise your product are items that you must disclose, disclose on that artwork. So, you know, I do, I do occasionally get submissions where people say something like, I, you know, we're, we're applying our proprietary blend of terpenes. Okay. And it can be a proprietary blend, but it can't be a secret blend because whatever's in that blend, you have to declare. Now, the other thing about terpenes is sometimes we'll have folks just use this as a shorthand. So I've got a hemp extract that may have hundreds of items in it, right, that are chemicals, okay? And 
you know, some proportion of those may be items that would be considered terpenes. So you're not really allowed on a label to just sort of cherry pick things out that are part of that extract to say, uh, I want to highlight the fact that these are present in my extract. So, you know, the rule is if you're going to go down that road, you better plan to list everything in that extract. And you probably don't really want to do that. Now, if you are adding, again, if you have a hemp extract, but you're also adding specific terpenes to that product, okay. But again, those need to be identified by name. Okay. Ready? Yes. Okay. All right. So responsible party declarations. Again, essentially this is the name and the address of what we call the responsible party for these products. So that's going to be the manufacturer or distributor, generally speaking. Now, there's a little bit of a wrinkle here, and you always need to bear in mind that the rule when we're talking about registering these consumable hemp products is uh, the responsible party is going to be, the, again, that's the people who are really responsible for that product. If you have something co-packed for you by a manufacturer, okay, and so that is your product, then, you know, if that, and then that artwork bears your name and your address on it, then you can, you know, register that product with us as your firm. But if you're just, you know, purchasing someone's off-the-shelf product that you want to carry at your facility and resell to someone else, that manufacturer or distributor needs to be the firm that's actually registering those products with us. And, you know, if you are a retailer of consumable hemp products, again, unless you are having products packed especially for you, you would not be registering products with this office. Okay, so that's one of the things we're going to ask you about when we see these submissions. Now, here's, the, here's another thing is your qualifying statement. So a qualifying statement is not required if you are the actual manufacturer of that product. But if you're not, then we expect to see something like these examples that we have here, packed for, distributed by, sold by, produced for, any of this kind of language, okay, that what that does is that tells the consumer that the listed firm is not the actual manufacturer of that product. And one of the other things, and this is just, again, something that we see a lot, uh, don't use a trade name or a brand name or an incomplete name as the responsible party name on that product. If your business name is Jim CBD LLC, and that's how you're registered, then we expect to see that entire name on there, not Jim's or not Jim CBD, the whole name. Brian, what's the uh, exception to the rule about if it's in a, which is very rare, you know, an actual phone book or a directory of some sort? What's that exception? <sighs> Okay, so with the address, typically, and I think, why don't you go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. Oh, good, okay, yeah. Okay, so typically what you're going to see is you have a street name and number or maybe a P.O. box, okay, and city, state, and zip code. Now, the city, state, and zip code are always required uh, we do sometimes see where people omit the zip code for no obvious reason, but it is required. The exemption that Mr. Gremion was referencing there, uh, if your business is listed in a local or internet telephone directory, so, you know, what that means is one of those white pages books uh, that they actually still distribute for some reason, uh, or uh, a directory, and the one example that I tend to use all the time because I don't know very many that are legitimately telephone directories is yp.com. 
I'm sure there's probably an equivalent for white pages and there wouldn't be any reason that your firm would be in the blue pages. So um, if your firm is listed in that type of directory, then you do not have to list the street name and number. But the mistake that people make all the time with that is they say, well, if I'm you know, listed with Google or I have a website for my business, then I qualify. That's actually not the case. It's very specific to telephone directories, either internet-based or uh, hard copy directory. And if it is inside a telephone directory, how would it differ from the, with the examples are on the screen right here? So what would they be allowed to use instead? Okay, so to just take this top one, uh, you would have uh, Joe's Best Hemp LLC, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70802. So if it's in a telephone directory of some sort, official, you don't have to actually put that street address is what we're trying to say but only in that situation. And we do check these things. So you leave it out, we're gonna tell you to put it back in. There are plenty of firms that, especially with this, you know, the hemp, CBD, the cannabis industry, oh no, I don't want them knowing where I'm growing or I'm producing. Unfortunately, you have to say those things. I mean, you once you do business and sell to the public, you have to be uh, transparent to some extent. You ready for your next slide? Yes, sir. Okay, so, you know, uh, we've, we've more or less touched on all of these uh, things not to do for this. You know, don't use partial names, don't use the substitute name, um, don't just put the name and not have an address. And then, unfortunately, I see this a lot too, and I'm not quite sure why, but some people just don't put any kind of responsible party declaration on the product. That's obviously not going to be acceptable. Okay, so I think the last one that, that we have here then in terms of your uh, statements that are going to be required is the allergen declaration. So there are eight groups of major food allergens and you really want to particularly pay attention to these when you're dealing with items that are intended for ingestion. Um, it's a little bit less of a concern for topicals, but, uh, these, the, this list here, these are the eight, the categories, of major food allergens. Now I've shown you the ones in red here and we've highlighted those in red for a particular reason, which is that we see this again in the food world a lot also with some of these hemp products where we're having those folks produce these for you is uh, people will fail to identify the specific allergen. So what is an allergen? Okay. An allergen is a sensitivity to a protein that's found in a particular product. Okay. And um, these are different. Okay. So a crab allergen is not going to be the same as a crawfish allergen. And a pecan allergy is not going to be the same as an almond allergy. Okay. And a cod allergy won't be the same as a drum allergy. So when you are listing allergens on that product, you do not, no, let me say this a different way. You should list those by the specific allergenic item that is in that product. And if you are unclear about whether that product contains any major food allergens, go back and talk to your supplier. If you're putting it together yourself, obviously, we would expect you to be aware of any major food allergens that comprise that product. Uh, Justin, do you want to touch on the importance of this? Of the, uh, I'm sorry, repeat your question again. Of the, the importance of actually declaring allergens. Oh, uh, correct. So, you know, as, as Mr. Warren is saying, you know, we want you to explicitly say, especially those ones in red, tell us exactly what they are. But 
allergen misinformation or elimination from a product label in general is basically a class one recall. One of the most uh, common reasons for recall across the, the state and the United States is because someone left an allergen off. And it's something simple sometimes. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's just an error. I mean, people make mistakes, but if somebody leaves uh, milk off of their label and there is a milk ingredient in there and it goes out into the world, someone can have a very dangerous adverse health effect from consuming that product. So again, this goes all goes back to the consumer being able to educate themselves before they consume these items. It has nothing to do with somebody trying to get your recipe or things like that. This is all going back to health reasons. So listing these allergens is extremely important. Now, there are little caveats to this, and we're trying to do the best we can to explain all of these. And, you know, sometimes we'll see where someone will say um, <clears throat> they add like a, a, a whey protein, uh, which is milk. It's a milk protein or casein. You know, it's milk proteins. Uh, and then they may say that in their ingredient list, casein. But later on on the bottom, in a statement right under the ingredients, they'll say, uh, this product contains milk. In that situation, you know, they do have the ingredient list correct, because they are, in fact, adding casein. But they went ahead and explained, as an add the allergen statement, that they do have milk in there. They said that word, milk. Then those are the kind of things that we're okay with, because a consumer would see that that product contains milk, they may not know what casein is. You know, so we have to say those words uh, very plainly. And it's one of the few areas where we want you to be very specific when you say things. Don't just say flour. Tell us that it's wheat flour. You know, tell us that it's soy flour. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a flour, and a flour is in not like hemp flour, or, you know, like the actual flour bud, uh, F L. O W E R. I'm talking about F L O U R flour, like ground up flour. Um, you know, if it's a, a, an, an almond flour, you know, say almond, don't say tree nut or things like that. We want to know exactly what it is so that a person doesn't have an allergic reaction and ends up ill and costing you because we have to recall this product. And is the, uh, is the next slide my, myself, Brian, I think? Uh, no, sir. We can yep. go ahead and go to the next one. one more. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So then these are the three broad, and, and again, we'll delve into each one in a little more detail. But these are the broad uh, items that are specific to consumable hemp products in terms of what label requirements we have. So... Uh, those are your link to your certificate of analysis for that batch of product, uh, claims and marketing language, and packaging for hemp flour. Okay. So the certificate or certificates of analysis. And this, again, goes back to the inception of this program, is that each item you know, there has to be a per batch analysis for potency or strength or cannabinoid profile, whatever your preferred terminology is for that, as well as contamination or residue for heavy metals, pesticides, microbiological organisms, and solvents. And now that we are actually doing hemp flour, we have exempted that product from requirement for residual solvent testing because, of course, it isn't something that has been uh, put through an extraction process, at least until the consumer gets his hands on it. So the way that we do this, of course, is there's a requirement for a QR code or a website link that is a part of that label that will link to those certificates of analysis for testing. Um, and so uh, let's see. I will also go ahead and mention while we're here, uh, part of that registration review in this area is that we will ask you to provide from your third party laboratory uh, a certificate usually is all it is, just a, a certificate from the 
accrediting agency that has uh, you know done the necessary um, records review and review of the facility and personnel training at that location to indicate that that facility is accredited under the ISO 17025 standard. So we'll ask you to give, to ask them to give you a copy of that document. And that is our verification that that is um, an ISO 17025 accredited facility, which is what we consider an approved laboratory for these purposes. Okay. Um, so, and the other thing that I'm uh, going to mention here is that because this is a fairly common question that comes up, you can do these required analyses on a bulk ingredient that's used to make multiple batches of different types of products. Um, but again, the label artwork for each of those things should reflect the um, link to the testing that's relevant to that particular product. Okay. Is this one mine? Mr. Yes, sir. So, uh, okay. so you wanted to go over this information. Okay. So I think everyone should understand this, but we still see these products or these claims and marketing language pop up sometimes on our products. You know, we do not want to see any language on there that is not, and I don't want to say the word scientifically proven because anyone, this is the day and age of the internet, anyone can go find a study or a claim or anything like that online and say, oh, look, there's a study or here it is. So I want to go ahead and put that on there. Okay. There are no claims. There is no treatment or cures or for any kind of conditions or anything, diseases that can be put on these products. Okay. We do not let people put, uh, you know, on their uh, packages of, you know, uh, I don't want to say I'm just going to, you're going to use something common that everybody uses things like, and I'm trying to use food items because I think that's where we're, where everybody's starting to head with these consumable hemp, you know, on Oreos that they can, you know, cure these things. And potentially that might be a, a poor example, but I'm trying to use something everyone knows. You cannot put these claims on there. You cannot say on your CBD tincture that this will soothe aches and pains if it's placed on a tooth or, uh, you know, on a wound, it'll help it heal faster. You cannot make claims like that. Um, I will go as far to say that we have absolutely stopped individuals from putting this will cure cancer. Uh, that's how, how uh, great that some of these claims will get. You cannot make any claims whatsoever on there. If the consumer, you know, if you tell the consumer what they're using it for, in other words, rolling on a spot, things like that, you know, it's a roll on, uh, that's perfectly fine. There's no problems you giving them directions on how to use it. But again, it's those claims that you can't put on there, what you, what potentially it could provide for them. The consumer will understand, you know, through marketing and such. And if it does provide that benefit, then they will continue to purchase that product. But at this point in time, we do not allow any types of claims like that on these products. Um, I will go as far as to say uh, that you shouldn't be doing that as well on your websites or your, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen any television commercials, but you can't do that as well if we did. We are not actively monitoring those websites. And I say actively, I'm not saying we don't, we're just not actively surfing through all of them, trying to find individuals that are putting that but I can assure you that the FDA is. And this is another uh, criteria where they have sent letters out to firms saying to cease and desist and pull that language off because they're in violation of law. And, you know, we may have to a small extent states rights, but, uh, you know, if any of these ingredients are crossing state lines, then you're on their turf. And of course you're on the internet, which is the world. Everybody has access to that for the most part. 
so none of that language should be up there. Uh, try to avoid uh, flamboyant language. And this is kind of goes back to where we were saying, uh, don't put in your ingredient list things like made with love or things like that. We don't want to see things, the, you know, and our example is the finest minimally processed sugar from beets. We don't want to see flamboyant language like that. It, it confuses the individuals. If you have a little statement on your label that maybe talks about your business and your operations, that's fine. That's not really a problem. We're not discouraging that. Um, you know, self-promotion, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just try not to cross that line and especially don't put it in your ingredient section. That should be clear to everyone. So uh, hemp flower packaging, this should be fairly clear again. Uh, we want them to be in tamper-proof packaging, you know, or bear a tamper-resistant seal. So this could be something where, uh, you know, a, a child cannot get into it, where they have to, you know, depress something, turn it, and then it opens some kind of seal. It's not just opened up or, you know, uh, a piece of label or something that crosses over a jar to where if that seal is broken, it shows that it's been tampered with, you know, a very tamper resistant seal, a shrink wrap over the top of it, those types of items. Um, again, we haven't really seen many problems with this because it seems like everybody's on board with that. That You don't want, you do not want persons tampering with your products either. So this is not really a bad thing. Fairly uh, self-explanatory. Okay, we have, we're actually running a little late, uh, but it's okay, we can go a little over. Um, you know, technically we only have about three minutes left, but we can go a little beyond. So I have been uh, reading in the chat and I've been trying to answer questions as much as I can. Now, uh, the chat, y'all potentially may not be able to see each other's questions, so I may read a few of them out loud and answer them so that we can learn from one another. Um, there was a question about uh, items like uh, zinc oxide. You know, zinc oxide is a very common ingredient that we used to see in sunscreens. Uh, it, it reflects the sun. You know, it's basically a mineral type product. Um, we do allow these in topicals again. This is not something that we want anybody consuming zinc oxide in their products, but consumable hemp products where it's a sunscreen or a lip balm, zinc oxide is allowed. Uh, and I said a word just now, I wanna make sure I explain that again, because I, I do think there's some confusion sometimes. I said that word consumable hemp. That doesn't always mean ingestible. To consume something means to use it up. So. Even if you're consuming a, a consumable hemp product that's a lip balm and you're putting it on, you're consuming it up. Um, I'm trying to go through the question. Let's see. Um, Brian, can you see the chat questions? I have seen. Uh, let's see. We will I've post seen two questions, questions actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the questions that just came through, will will we post a recording of this webinar? We will. Uh, it needs to be, you know, these are Zoom things, so they condense it. It gets sent to us in a day or two. We have to uncondense it and then ask our web text to put it on a, a YouTube channel and then we can link it to our website. So give us a few days, it'll pop up. Uh, keep checking back at our website. And again, uh, I apologize, we failed to put that up on our website, uh, our website up there, but it is uh, ldh.la.gov slash hemp. Uh, let's see if I can type it into the, uh, let's see, I'm going to type it into the chat now. There we go. And it should, everybody should be able to see that. Uh, any information that we post rules, changes, these webinars, things like that, uh, forms, uh, any little snippets info or our status always goes up on our website. Uh, Brian, you have a question there. I think it was about uh, infusion, hemp flower infused with Delta-8. Do you see that question? I actually have only seen two questions. One was about uh, 
incense, and the other one was about the use of hemp supplement as a statement of identity. Okay, why don't you go ahead and answer your incense one. Okay, so, uh, the, sh <laughs> so the short answer to this is there is no way for you to uh, market a an incense uh, product in a way where that can be registered with us. Uh, this is an item that is going to be inhaled and uh, we'll go ahead and just go and stipulate this as well uh, for items that are um, marketed as pre-rolls. These are all items that would be used for inhalant purposes and cannot be registered. These are not legal to sell in Louisiana at this time. If that changes, that will be done you know, with the legislature actually making those changes. So think about that. I want to go ahead and explain that for a minute. You're burning incense. You know, you're breathing it in. That's inhalation. You're smelling it. That's inhalation. So at that time, we're not doing any type of inhalation at this time. Same thing with potpourri. You're smelling it. You're breathing it in. So that's not the intended pur and, and, and purpose or intent of those products. Uh, there's not many other things that you could do with incense. You know, I wouldn't want to add it to a food product that would not be very helpful or tasty, I would imagine. Uh, but with a flower, uh, even though it is a little strange, uh, but um, you'd have to have a lot of flour, you could still add a flower to a food product if someone got home and wanted to do something with it. You know, it's not necessarily specifically for inhalation. That's why flour is allowed through. Right. You can create at your own at-home extracts using flower products. Correct. Which was the intent of those items. Uh, the other one uh, has to do with, again, the, the term hemp supplement. So, yes, that was one of our examples, and we did do that on purpose. So, um, the term hemp supplement or cannabidiol supplement or cannabinol supplement or even you know, Delta 8 THC supplement. All of those types of declarations are permissible as statements of identity or, well, yes, as statements of identity. Um, so it is, the, the language in the statute is specific to use of the term dietary. So if you're going to say dietary by itself on there somewhere or you want to characterize the product as a dietary supplement, that is prohibited. But the other formulations that I characterized earlier, they are allowed. Uh, Brian, I don't think you can see this question, um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, it. It was in general terms, and, I, and you know, some of the questions we're getting in the chat, you know, it mentioned specific firms and things like that, so I'm going to kind of reword some of them generically. So that I try to, again, so everybody can kind of hear the answer as well. Uh, you know, one of the questions is, you know, they're getting a product, uh, you know, they're buying it wholesale, they're getting it uh, delivered to them. And, and of course, the person that's, that is asking this question, um, you know, we may reach out to you and clarify a little more. We might want some more information uh, about your specific operation. So this might not answer your question. But I want to generically go over this again and say, uh, generally go over it and say, um, you know, if you're buying a product or it's being produced for you, you know, it's a wholesale production facility, they're producing it for you, you know, they're making a gummy or something for you, um, you know, it's your recipe, it's your, they're formulating it, you get it, that's your product, you know, it's manufactured by this other company, you're the distributor of it, you know, you're distributed by or manufactured for, and you would put your company, now you could put the other company, you have to say manufactured by, but of course, your company name wouldn't be on there. So that is a little bit of a choice on your end. You just have to be honest when you label that package. If it's made by someone else, and then you put your own company name and say manufactured by, well, that's actually not true. You're just distributing it, you know, or it was manufactured for you, not by you. So that there makes a big difference when you use those words. So be very clear when you label your items. People are not allowed to buy items that are 
made for someone else and then relabel them for, for their use. And I'll give you an example. Um, and I used it before. I'll go back to Oreos. Again, everybody knows what an Oreo is. So you can't go buy something similar to an Oreo and repackage it and put your own label on it. Hey, these are my, my Oreos now or my cookies. You can't, you say the word Oreo, that's going to be a trigger, but you can't rename. That's, that's their product. You can, you're basically taking someone else's product. So that's not okay. But if it was specifically made for you, some other company was producing something similar for you, that's different. That's okay. You can't take other people's products. And I, just to, to uh, add to that a little bit, first off, I, I have my own example of something that actually happened probably about five years ago now. But we did have a firm that uh, was wanting to uh, purchase uh, grits from uh, local Sam's Club and put that in their packaging and call it their product. And so we had to explain to them that that's not a legal thing to do. But um, kind of to build on the, the last thing that Mr. Grimion just said, uh, there are firms who manufacture products specifically for the purpose of uh, other firms to be able to repack those items. And, uh, you know, in that situation, it is acceptable for you to repackage that product and put your information on it. But you have to be very clear that that product is indeed intended for that purpose. So that is something where you would need to have some documentation from that manufacturer or distributor indicating that. Um, I have a question about uh, gummies. So um, the short answer to the question of whether Delta-8 THC uh, gummies are allowed under the new rules is yes. But as is the case with almost everything, there's a longer answer. Remember when we went over um, the net quantity of contents Okay, and I spent a little bit of time talking about how in Louisiana there is a you know one percent threshold for that total THC content. So, if you have a package uh, that you want to register here that exceeds that threshold, then we are going to tell you no, you cannot register that item here. So, if you have some product that, you know, it might be packaged somewhere else or someone may package their product for you uh, under your brand, but it's something that, you know, might be legal or at least not illegal to sell in some other jurisdiction. But, you know, you come over, you, you come and we want to register it here, but if it, that package exceeds that 1% then we are not going to be able to register that for you. Okay, everybody, uh, we're coming to the end of the presentation. So again, uh, if we have not gotten to your, um, your question, if we didn't answer anything specifically, or you think of something later, uh, we have our emails up right there on the screen. I typed them in the chat as well. Uh, I did put our general phone number up there for the main line, just so you have it. But again, we prefer that you email us questions. Uh, I would say go ahead and email both of us every time so that if one doesn't grab it, the other can grab it. You know, we're kind of kind of covering for one another. Uh, we also ask that you be patient with us. Uh, we get lots of emails per day. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, Mr. Warren also covers not only consumable hemp, but all food and drug products and all milk and dairy products. Uh, in addition to those, I also regulate uh, molluscan shellfish, commercial seafood, beaches, things like that. So we do lots of other things. Please be patient with us if you send us an email. Um, make sure you put your contact information in email so that we can reach back out to you. Email addresses, your name, phone number, things like that. 
Um, sometimes things get lost in translation and we have trouble reaching back at it. So that always helps as much information as you can give us. So uh, thank you for participating. And again, look for the website. If, if we happen to create another webinar, we will put the announcement on the website. So check back often. So thank you, everyone.